Thank you so much, Chris. Such a pleasure to join you again and to have this conversation. And I very much appreciate your taking the time uh, to discuss it with me. You and I share very much an alignment in our objectives to achieve a more optimal distribution of the human population in the grandest sense that's actually what this book sets out to do. Um, you know, I am fundamentally a geographer at heart, a geographer and a traveler. And my starting point was to frame the world as being a misalignment of geographies. We have our natural geography of the earth and natural resources. We have our globes and maps in which green is the forests and brown is the deserts and blue is the oceans. We have our political geography, the lines and borders of states that divide us. And we have our functional or economic geography of infrastructure, industry, and so forth. And we have our human geography, us, Chris, 8 billion of us. That's fundamentally what is all of our greatest concern. What is the distribution of the 8 billion people on the planet? That is our human geography. And these four layers of geography, Chris, are terribly misaligned. The location of resources, the location of industry, the location of states, and the location of people, it, you could almost say it makes very little sense when you think about how dynamic, how unpredictable, how uncertain the world is today. And the geography of need for labor and investment and talent versus where those people are, the geography of resources, just basic natural resources, whether it's fresh water or food, versus where the people are, and so on and so on. So there's so many misalignments. And in the biggest picture sense, applied to billions of people, my goal was to actually try to co correct those misalignments. Mm, I fully agree. I think you summed it up very nicely. And that's also what we observe, of course, working with investors, but also with asylum seekers and issues on the humanitarian side. And there's a global uh, move. I think your the title of your book is very appropriate. There is a global move really around the world that is, in my opinion, unstoppable. It, at, at Henley, you know, you're working, uh, as you said, not only with investors, but also asylum seekers, right, through your programs, through your charities, and I think maybe not enough people appreciate and understand that, but it, this is not just a movement that relates to thousands of people or even millions of people, it is billions of people, and if we think about the drivers of mobility, uh, it can be economic crises, it can be technological automation, it can be political instability, it can be climate change, or interestingly enough, it can be all of those things at the same time. Literally today we live in a world where climate change is a major driver of migration. Uh, just look at, of course, floods and droughts and sea level rise and so forth. And it happens in rich countries and in poor countries. The floods in Germany, as well as the droughts in uh, Africa. But you will have entire countries disappear, actually. I mean, we've seen some islands uh, we're talking to in the South Pacific that will literally face a prospect of an entire small nation having to relocate. I mean, it's unprecedented, I think. And then worldwide, low-lying lands, um, they will have an issue around the world and uh, the desertification globally is a big problem. And as you said, at the same time, there's a global increased um, volatility, political and economic volatility that will also have more people move. So it's a lot to come. In the last uh, 30 years, Chris, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, most migration, the majority of human migration, has settled or stabilized into these regional clusters and patterns within the Western Hemisphere, within the former Soviet Union, within Africa, within Asia, and of course, within Europe. But what we're going to see is actually a surge in new vectors of inter-regional migration. And we're seeing this, of course, with the movement of Africans across the Mediterranean, the movement of Arabs into Europe as well, and the movement of South Asians, potentially further northward into Central Asia. These are new vectors, and one of the most important, and this is where I think uh, you know, Henley is very active, it's the movement of Asians into the West. Um, now, the dominant vector of Asians to the West was actually trans-Pacific. There are 25 million 
Asian Americans. I myself grew up as an Asian American when we immigrated to the United States. But today and in the future, one of the things that I forecast in the book is the rise of what I call Asian Europeans, which is to say Chinese, Indian, Vietnamese, um, uh, Indonesian, Pakistani, and so forth, who are increasingly investing in or moving at a young age as students to Europe because Europe has become more competitive and increased its English language academic offerings and so forth. So for many reasons, one of, one of the predictions I make is that even though today there are less than 5 million Asian Europeans outside of the UK, of course, because the United Kingdom has- UK yeah. is particular and has a different history, yeah. But the EU has only 4 million Asians currently living in the EU. And I do predict, Chris, that that number will be larger than the number of Asian Americans, which, as I said before, is 25 million. And so that will be one of the great new inter-regional migration patterns, among others. So what we have to open our minds to, Chris, is a truly global recirculation of the human population. And this should not scare people. You and I both agree that this is not only desirable, this is necessary, this is essential, this is in so many people's best interest. And we have a duty, an obligation to convince people to accept this. This is the right thing for humanity to be doing in this century. Absolutely. I mean, that is also what I spoke about just last week, actually, that in Europe in particular, even more so than in America, where, right, you say, in an, an Asian Americans, you know, they occupy key positions in America already. It's very integrated in America. Um, in Europe, it's far behind. But Europe in particular needs more immigration, whether we like it or not. So this will happen whether we want it or not. And it's clear to me too, I think you make a very good point that there will be more Asian immigration because that is something that Europe particularly needs because of the skill set of Asians and so forth. There's a number of things, a number of factors that I think you are quite right, that that is what we're going to see, particularly in Europe. And Europe actually is a very interesting place in many ways for people around the world, probably more interesting than many other places in the world in many ways but we will see what comes in the future don't you think here the populist politics particularly in europe is a bit of a hindrance of course it has been a significant hindrance though europe also has had episodes uh, such as of course the migration of turkish guest workers in the post-war decades and other populations of a very peaceful and steady inward flow of migrants that has obviously been economically beneficial. And not enough people in Germany, for example, appreciate that the reason that the German labor force actually expanded in 2015 through 2017 is precisely because of the integration of uh, refugees and migrants from uh, Arab countries and beyond. And so what I like to say is that, you know, European, Europe does not have an immigration problem or a migration problem. Europe has an assimilation problem because from a supply demand perspective, and of course, on the, from the perspective of European countries whose outstanding pension liabilities are by far the largest in the world, it is absolutely essential to recruit the next generation of service workers, of caregivers, of taxpayers in the in the economy. And so it's not only just uh, a, a general need to import people, specifically the way I frame it in the book is a war for young talent, because young people are those that are the consumers, the spenders, they're more likely to have children, of course, in order to replenish the population. There is no future without youth, right, Chris? So the, uh, you know, the demographic that I focus on the most is, is today's young people, which means people under the age of 40, Generation Y or Millennials, Generation Z, today's uh, teens. And what's interesting is they are the most mobile generation in human history, right? They've grown up in a post Cold War world in a world where the passport power, you know, in, in for on the, the average, let's say, and, and you know this better than anyone in the world, Chris, but the average access that a passport has, has been improving, even if there is still a very, very strong hierarchy. So a mobile world of young people is a world in which we should be competing to attract them into our countries. We should be diversifying the range 
of immigration opportunities that they have. And that's, of course, you know, what you do so well. Absolutely. And I think it's on the entire spectrum of migration where we're going to see uh, an increase. So, you know, you have more people on the move because they absolutely have to because of war and floods and problems wherever they are now. They have to leave their homes. Um, some estimates go by almost, you know, several hundred million, almost uh, half a billion people um, in some cases that will actually have to move um, because they don't have a choice. And then you have the, the situation in Europe, for instance, where you quite rightly point out that we actually need uh, more young people because otherwise we will have a serious issue anyway with our pension systems and the way Europe with the welfare system is structured. It's a bit different than America, I think. Um, and then you have investors, talented people that are globally mobile already now. They have the choice. So they, they will choose countries according to where it's actually attractive. And here also, we're going to have to be competing on a global scale much more even than before. So here, you know, Singapore, Dubai, Europe, North America, South America, you know, we all have different advantages and disadvantages, but it's definitely a more competitive environment for talent and investors. And this is going to be also something I think will shape the future. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. By the way, you mentioned the a challenge of populist politics, but then there's also the challenge of regulations, right? And, you know, despite the compelling arguments that I believe you and I are making, we also have pressure now from the European Union, G20 and others to curb uh, investor migrant investment citizenship uh, programs. And I think, of course, that's very unfortunate because that reduces one of the key channels that exists to um, enable or create a pathway uh, for people to move in this way. But I think, again, governments will wake up to the demographic reality sooner or later. The only question is when. The mortality rate uh, uh, for baby boomers and the elderly even beyond will start to accelerate as we reach 2030 and into the future beyond that. But the next 10 years is not fiscally survivable without having, or even socially, quite frankly, in terms of ensuring the dignity of our populations, maintaining the infrastructure, and having that labor force uh, live up to its expectations to produce growth, none of that is going to happen without fixing that problem today, not waiting for 10 years from now. But you know, what, what we see globally is actually on the level of, of individual states the investor immigration and talent immigration is constantly expanding, regardless of what uh, EU or others are saying. So the actual situation on the ground is that this is globally expanding, and I don't think it will actually be possible to stop that. What can happen is regulation, and that's also a good thing, that it, there's maybe more scrutiny to who moves, there's more checks and more balance in that, but that is not a stoppable thing, I think, because the states have realized worldwide that they need the talent and they need the investment. Mm -hmm. And that will shape our future. I'm not sure how many nomad visa programs there were before the pandemic. Of course, Absolutely. We're familiar <laughs> with the Estonia example, but as you've uh, documented, there's at least 60 or 70 uh, today. And in general, investor migration programs are, you know, number more than 100. What I have seen uh, here in Asia as well is that, you know, young people are looking at the world and because especially if they are services workers, knowledge workers, they're looking at their cost of living. They're looking at the purchasing power uh, parity indices. Uh, they're looking at, you know, really how far their capital can stretch in deciding where to go. And as you pointed out, this is a global competition now. And we see young people in Bali and in uh, you know, Phuket and these you know, off the beaten track kinds of places that are very well digitally connected, that are connected in terms of airports and aviation and where the quality of life is superb. So we should not be surprised when uh, you know, incumbent societies, wealthy countries that have traditionally dominated uh, the quality of life indices Still, if they're not providing the most hospitable lifestyle environment for young people, those young people will still go elsewhere because they're much more global, much more adventurous uh, and looking for new experiences and opportunities. And, and of course, I, I fully, fully endorse that. And I've looked so much at some of the, um, you might even say, uh, you know, sort of distant signals 
in youth behavior, for example, the number of students taking gap years, the number of students studying the international baccalaureate instead of national systems, and survey data around common values of youth and which countries or societies are building the most youth bridges that encourage movement of people between those societies. And Chris, every bit of that research that I've done points to completely global connections and pathways of opportunity for, for mobility that young people are taking advantage of. So I offer these um, anecdotes in a way as an entry point so that people can actually see the future now rather than being surprised and, and, and uh, regretting that they missed the opportunity to capitalize on those trends. Um, Para, thank you very much for sharing your fascinating and illuminating insights with Handling Partners today. And, you know, we look forward to your book, Move. I think it's certainly going to be a rich and insightful exploration of our times and a glimpse into what's probably lying ahead for us and our grandchildren. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Always such a pleasure.